I moved here when I was about 40. The idea being that I thought 40 is a dangerous age. You could start to look over the nest and so on. And so I decided I'd better find something to do. And I bought this derelict place and decided to restore it and keep it as a wildlife sanctuary. This is wild bit here. Lots of orchids. I just cut it as a wild flower meadow. Another orchid. And more more orchids. All over it you'll get orchids. It has never been grazed. When I was a boy at school, we had uh, names. They were mainly Scottish names for the local wild birds. Uh, Whop was a curlew. Prow was a crow. Scaldies were the young birds in the nest. We talked, referred to them as scaldies. A yellow yarling was a yellow hammer. A chitty wren was a wren. Uh, a peeweep was a lapwing. These were our local names for them. A heron crown was a grey heron. And uh, moorfowl were grouse. Now we didn't have many grouse, but they were always referred to as moorfowl. Uh, a, a snipe, snipe was a popular common bird. And it was, there were different names. We called them gutter snipes because they were always in a wet place. Or the nicer name was a heather bleat. The heather bleat was uh, derived from the snipe would fly away up into the sky and fan out its tail and plunge towards the ground and it makes this like a goat bleating almost sound and it was known in our country as a heather bleat. Yellowhammers were common, now they're quite rare. Goldfinches were common and now you haven't nearly as many as we did have. Uh, the f type of farming we do uh, there are no rough areas. Every the government pays the farmer to drain the wet areas and to to get rid of hedges and so on, and that has done away with a whole lot of the food the food chain for wildlife. Pandemic is a word on everybody's lips. We're living in a pandemic. A hundred years ago, nineteen and eighteen, nineteen and nineteen, we had a pandemic. It was the Spanish flu it was called, although it didn't originate in Spain. But the Spanish flu killed 23 to 25,000 people in Ulster. My family were affected by that flu because my grandfather and grandmother died within a year of each other. And they left six children. In that family, there was a Covenanter minister. And instead of, normally you would have adopted, the, had the children made, put out for adoption, but he decided no, in the traditional Scottish way, he decided that he had brothers and sisters with family and no family. And he divided the children up around his brothers and sisters. This is my father here. He was the eldest of the family. Uncle Russell and Uncle Jim, Uncle John and Aunt Jean, she was the baby. My uncles, when they were abroad, the language really was diluted and changed by, by these people migrating to different countries and coming back home again. They always came to our house. My father was the eldest and they always came there. And the language that they had left in Ireland had gone. One has an American accent from England an English accent, the only one who had any Scottish accent. I decided that I needed a neutral language, so I just spoke simple English. <laughs> Thank you.
my own family have, uh, originated as far back as, as 1828 in, 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 in Ulster, but they were probably Scots who'd moved across to Ulster and, and then back again. We're standing at the, the entrance to a farm called Toddstone, and, and Todd in Scots is, um, is Fox. So Todd Lowry was the Sunday name for the fox, if you like, centuries ago, and that became shortened to Todd. So Todd Stone is the fox's stone, or Todd Holes is a common name in southern Scotland, that that's fox holes, etc. And this is Todd, Todd Stone Farm, um, just behind us here with the rinds of kells in the background. When I grew up in, in coal mining Ayrshire, we, we had a lot of familiar wild bird names that weren't the English names. I'm thinking of birds like the whop, which in English is the curlew, which is a, a, you know, a long-billed uh, wader, uh, very familiar along the coast of, of Northern Ireland. And it's called the whop in Northern Ireland as well. Um, the cutty wren, cutty in Scots means small, and, and the chitty wren in, in Ulster Scots is the, is the wren, uh, as it's cutty wren in Scotland. Um, birds like the gowk, the gowk is, is Scots for cuckoo. The mavis, which is um, known throughout Scotland as the, the song thrush in English, but it's also mavis in, uh, in Northern Ireland as well, in Ulster. Um, birds like spiog. Uh, we call sparrows, so that's the house sparrow is the spiog and the tree sparrow is the tree spiog and in, in Ulster it's spiog or spug as well. Um, and then there are um, uh, birds like uh, that have several names. So in my village, a tiny mining village, New Cumnock in, in, in Ayrshire, um, the yellow hammer, we called it the, the Scotch canary because it's yellow and, and of course in the mining area, canaries used to be taken down the mines to, to uh, indicate uh, fire damp and, and, and serious uh, poisonous gas problems. But I was also very familiar with yellow yite uh, and yellow yite is a name that is given to the yellow hammer in Wigtonshire and of course we had Wigtonshire families from the very southwest of Scotland who moved into Ayrshire to work in the mines and, and yellow yorlin which is also used in parts of, of Ulster as well and yellow yorlin is another name for the yellow hammer so there in one village you have um, several different names for the same bird. I grew up, I was born in a house, in a council house overlooking Glen Afton, which had lots of birds, of course, but the thing that really got me into it was um, helping out my dad, who was a salmon fisherman on, on various rivers in Ayrshire, the Doon and the Stinshire and the Disk, and um, my job was to look out for the water bailiff coming, and that was a very boring and tedious and long, long job. He was fishing away and uh, had all the excitement, so, uh, but I, I took notice of the, the, the water birds, so goosander, dipper, grey wagtail um, and, and that's how I passed my time seeing the heron of course would come in and, uh, and I got to, to observe them very closely and, and uh, that, how got I, that got me through and passed, passed the time and I developed on to uh, seeing other birds and thinking well what are they and we had some lochs nearby they were actually lagoons from the, the mines that, that, that were filled up with silt and periodically flooded etc and they attracted wading birds and that's what got me, got me into it sort of thing but uh, but it's the earliest memories are of um, uh, watching dippers and goosanders while Dad was fishing. At the moment we're in a wee bit called Taris, Taris Glen, Taris Valley, call it what you will. It's almost a burn when you get up here into the headlands, but uh, it's a river in its own right that flows into the river Borderesk, which is the big river that more or less divides Scotland from England on the west coast. And uh, these waterfalls just below you here come the back end next month and the month after up towards Christmas you'll get numbers of migratory fish, uh, sea trout and salmon coming up here to spawn. 
my old uncle, Uncle Harry, that was a shepherd here, he used to talk to me about bills, B-I-L-S. And he says, the bills will be coming up to spawn. And um, anyway, it transpires, if you look at the geography round about here on the map, there's a place called Billum, and there's another wee place called Billop. And they're the name of the burns that run through them as well. And uh, Bills was a, an old name for sea trout. But there's all kinds of names you get up on the hill there. You'll get uh, Lavericks, which is a name for a lark. You'll get a Sunny Laverick, which is a name for a sandpiper, which you get on the river here. Uh, oh, there's any gods giving them out, I would think. Hulet, that's a name for an owl. Trees, I barks instead of birch, socks instead of alder trees. And just round the corner, you maybe can't see it, there's an ash. And there's a, there's a pool on the river called the Plain Trees. And I think years ago, folks used to refer to ash and maybe sometimes sycamore as Plain Trees. And I think that becomes, because they were easy cut, they were easy split with an axe for the fire. There were no big knots in them, but I couldn't swear to that. But plain trees for ash, aye. My father's from Gretna, and, uh, but before that, a couple of generations ago, my family were Brennans from County Antrim. My father was an engineer and he left Gretna and he went across to County Antrim to work there at the airport and I grew up in Northern Ireland so I'm kind of an Ulster Scott in reverse gear if you like. To me this and the north coast of Antrim is the same territory, Dalriada if you like, go right back to Dalriada. Every farm had flax and they supplied the flax to the local factories. Linen was very important around here. There were nine mills in this part of the river. Nine linen mills. This, where I live, belonged to the factory at uh, Dramona and that was upstream of here. There's a date on the mill which I, I can barely see. Some of you maybe can see it either. 1872, does that say? I think it's 1872. Uh huh. We bought the place with the intention of living upstairs, re roofing this and living upstairs and having underneath then for all our garage and things like that. But uh, the planners weren't too helpful and that slowed us down and the first winter we were here we lived up on the old house in the height and that winter November, December, January was very foggy and damp and this sat in, uh, in fog all winter and I could see then why the people built their houses up there in the height it was out bright sunshine up there and dense fog down along the river the temperature up on the yard would be three degrees higher than the temperature here. So we decided, no, we'll not um, build here, we'll build up in the new up there. 
Beetling was a process in the linen industry when the lengths of cloth were put through a machine with big wooden hammers. It was a sort of final production stage. It was a very noisy process. Everybody who worked in a beetling mill was deaf. The guinea hens fly up onto the gate and fly up into the tree and roost there. But the high ground you see the, beside the house, the high ground, that field was that height. That field sloped from the river up and that was where the linen was laid out. The main project I worked on was the Dolichan uh, scheme on the river. The Dolichan's a Loch Ness trout and it comes up the various tributaries to uh, spawn. And the overfishing in the loch had reduced the numbers and over the years living on the river I was able to monitor very carefully what was happening. And the Dolichan runs had gradually decreased and I decided that we'd have to do something about it. So we built, a, I built a fish transporter from a milk tank and put an aerator in it so that we could transport f adult fish between the river and the hatchery. We built that, we tried a system of holding the fish in a pond until they were ready to spawn, but that wasn't a success. So we got in touch with a hatchery and Alan Keyes came on the scene. Alan uh, and I became very friendly and we started to electrofish, take adult fish from the different headwaters, take them to the hatchery, hatch the young and wait until they were an inch and a half or so long, just when they were ready to release into the burns. We did a survey of all the burns that were, that were clean and suitable for uh, stocking with fish and we put the Dolichan fry into all the various burns on the headwaters of the river. And gradually over the years, we built up the Dolichan stocks and now they're reasonable. They're not as good as they might be. Going back to the 70s and 80s, most of the anglers, myself included, were heading to Donegal and Mayo uh, and Connemara to catch fish. And uh, I think it was in, in Ballina one evening, uh, we wondered what, why are we coming here? What's wrong with our own river? And at that time, the, the Do Dolohan numbers had declined and the salmon run had gone down. So that's why we were going other places to fish. Coming from farming, I thought, you just need to breed millions of Dolohan and millions of salmon, put them out in the river. But we found out that that's not, uh, that's one tool in the box, if you like, uh, to run a hatchery. But uh, the, the habitat is most important to get the habitat right. Habitat destruction, if you like, was the main reason why the, the fish had disappeared. The water quality has been getting better, uh, but there was a period uh, during flax growing, whenever the, the flax was retted in flax dams and uh, the, the water after the flax retting was let out. In fact, there's, there's three mills just upstream of where we're standing. So that flax water would have been uh, killing fish during that period of 30 or 40 years during the flax growing period. Back, I think, in the 50s, the Ballandary River uh, had a major drainage scheme right from Loch Ney right up to Cookstown, where the diggers went in, lifted out the bed of the river, including all the pearl mussels, and scattered them on the fields. And this wee section here that we're in, in Wellbrook, there's three miles that wasn't touched. We started to hatch Dolohan and salmon, put them out in the river, the Dolohan is the trout that got locked into Loch Ney after the Ice Age. So you have Loch Erne trout and Loch Corrib trout, and the Loch Ney trout are, are uh, called Dolohan. This is actually the first groin that we built. 
groins. Now that's just a line of stones across the river. Just at the, at the bottom of this little glade, there's a lovely panel of gravel and that made new spawning areas for the dolichan and salmon. So we were putting out baby, baby fish and giving them somewhere if you like to lay their eggs. When a hen fish comes up, she'll pick her place and she, if, I, if I do this, I'm sinking down into the gravel. I'm now down about six or nine inches. And so you need nice loose gravel and you can see when, when this dust clears, uh, th there's, there's a piece of clean gravel there where the cows have been in. So that, that's what you're looking for, fast water, the right size of gravel, and if, if everything's right then you get a pair of fish spawning here and you'll see a big mound of clean gravel after the fish have been and gone. I didn't know much about mussels until I went to uh, a seminar on freshwater pearl mussels uh, and uh, learnt a bit about the life cycle of the mussel, uh, got interested and then we started to try to breed them in the hatchery. This site is actually one of the ones where we've been releasing the captive bred mussels uh, and uh, just above the bridge here there's a good few hundred uh, captive bred mussels that ha have been located here along with the, the old wild pearl mussels. Uh, so we're sort of providing the new gravel fords for the trout, Dolohan trout to spawn on just downstream of where the mussels are. The female mussel produces uh, eggs and if she's living close enough to a male mussel uh, those eggs become fertilized. Uh, she broods them on her gill for a, a month then she literally spits them out and they flow, flow away in the current and they have to get onto the gill of a trout so they're going down the stream snapping looking for a trout to inhale them to latch onto the gills. They stay in the trout for nine months and then they fall off uh, and bury down into the gravel in the bed of the river, stay there for four years, buried, and come up the size of your wee fingernail, and then they can live to their 200. The older people that live along the river would have gone out and smashed the pearl mussel adults open looking for pearls, and a lot of them had four or five pearls and matchboxes that they kept, but uh, it, it appears there's only a, a, a pearl in every hundred mussels that you kill, and then every hundred pearls that you find, there's only one valuable one. So count that up, <laughs> you've killed 10,000 to get a valuable pearl mussel. This is a hazel stick that we've just cut, and we're going to try and turn it into a tang, which is probably a, an old Scottish term. They would have, they'd have been using one of these where the, where the water is very deep uh, to, to reach in to lift a, a mussel with a tang. So you to watch it don't cut my hand. So if you like, is that a, 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 that's opening up. Uh, they would have tied a bit of string around here, put a little piece of timber in where the, the knife is. So if you can imagine the, the mussel is on the bed of the river and they push the stick down, then it grips, it grips the, uh, the mussel and you can lift it out. So that's a, a tang.
freshwater pearl mussel is a globally endangered species, so it's on the same endangered list as the giant panda or the Bengal tiger. I think when a lot of people think of endangered species, their mind wanders away to the Amazon, but we actually have these species on our own doorstep. This is an adult um, freshwater pearl mussel. Uh, you can see the size of this one here is quite large. So this is probably at least 100 years old. So it's quite plausible that this mussel was a baby in the Ballandere River when the Titanic left Belfast on its maiden voyage. The freshwater pearl mussel has a very long history. Um, they are actually found naturally uh, right across what's called the Halo Arctic region. So right across Russia, Northern Europe, even far as down into Spain. Uh, and right across Britain and Ireland. Uh, and they do contain pearls, or some of them do. Uh, and that's what has contributed actually to some of their decline. Pearls were fished in the rivers right across these islands. And those people that fish them were called pearl fishermen. Uh, and they would have gone out with glass bottom buckets looking for these pearls. Um, it became illegal in Scotland and in England and Wales to fish for these pearls because they're so rare now. And then it also became illegal in Ireland. But in Northern Ireland for a period of time, there was no legislation stopping the fishing of pearls. So there were records of Scottish pearl fishers unable to fish legally in Scotland, coming over to Northern Ireland to fish pearls out of the rivers here. When you look at the, the, the crown jewels of Scotland, there are lots of pearls in them. And those pearls uh, were from the rivers in Scotland and probably also from the rivers in Ireland. James I of England, who was also James VI of Scotland at the time, decreed that any freshwater pearls found in Scottish rivers had to be handed over to the Crown. So you can see the value of those mussels and how highly prized they were. But of course, that didn't stop people pearl fishing for these pearls and they were still in circulation in the general public at the time as well. Freshwater mussels are uh, particularly rare species. Over half of the population of freshwater pearl mussels of the world are found in Scotland. I grew up in Dumfries and Galloway, and as kids we regularly used to find shells washed up on riverbanks, and, but very, very rarely now. But we are aware of two populations, one which is quite well known near Newton Stewart, and we found a new one um, just a few years ago, following a report from someone that their son had sat on one, um, about 20 years ago when, when he was a little boy guddling around in the burn and we went and used that and we went and had a look and we, and we found a population which looks like it's reproducing. The fascinating thing for us was, was that summer we then went and electrofished downstream and we found the little larvae in the gills of the trout population locally. So that shows that those pearl mussels are reproducing. When I first started at the Trust, the, the, this old lady used to pop into the office and she would tell us the sparling were coming and she was always right and she knew that by looking at her, the daffodils and that would make sense because fish are very temperature related, so are often plants and um, it's, it's all related and she would tell us the sparling would be here very soon um, and she remembered it as a, as a very important moment when people could go down and and catch loads of fish. They literally could catch them. You can just pick them out sometimes. When they're spawning, they jump out onto the bank. They're not a particularly slippery fish. But another way people used to catch them was buckets with holes drilled in, and they would just throw them into the river and haul through them and pull them out. Historically, you do wonder if you go back hundreds of years, when you had all of these rivers healthy uh, and, and yet healthy populations, they all came in. It, it must have been a very important food source, probably in sort of March, April, which is before a lot of other foods start, start to become available, that you had this mass of fish coming, coming into the rivers. 
We have studied them for a number of years, trying to understand the health of the population and understand what the problems are for them to try and protect them in the long term. They live in the estuary and then on, on the high water tides, they spawn en masse. They're a very vulnerable species. When the water temperature is over five degrees, in the middle of the night, in the dark, they turn up in tens of thousands, and as the tide drops away, they're, they're left there and, and they spawn. In a very small area of river, you're maybe talking about a few hundred square metres of the river, is where all of this spawning takes place. When the sparling are there, one of the techniques that we use to, to, to check that they're there, because it's a big job for us, so if we want to research and we're out two, three o'clock at night, and we're working with, with torches trying to find these fish, we look for predators. So we see big increases in the number of cormorants, magansas, uh, gusanders, herons. You know, we once saw 19 herons in a row when, when they were actually spawning through the day in, in a section. Never seen anything like that before. We also have seals that sometimes come up. We have a, one of our trustees lives further down the estuary, right beside the river, and he's seen porpoises following them up before as well. The one type of pollution that we do suffer from in Dumfries and Galloway is acidification. That's been largely caused by old style forestry on upland peatland areas. And it's particularly the, the heavily drainage of these peatland areas that has lowered the pH, has released pollutants from, from, from that peatland. The conifer trees have, uh, can also scavenge pollutants from the air. And, and that has decimated the tops of some of the rivers in Galloway. And the way we need to sort it is, is enhance and increase peatland restoration and better forest management. And we, we are starting to see that in some areas um, where, where, where for, with forestry restructuring, they can take the trees off, off sensitive areas. The whole area around Loch Ney is wetland. If we were here, you know, prior to the 1600s, it's wooded and it's very boggy. 1685, William King, who was actually from this area, and he became Archbishop of Dublin, and he published a book called Of the Bogs and Lochs of Ireland. And he said, the bogs offered an advantage to the resident natives who deliberately built near them the bogs are a shelter and a refuge of Tories, i.e. the dispossessed natives and outlaws, and thieves who can hardly live without them. They take advantage to them to have the country unpassable, and the fewer strangers came near to them, they lived easier. The bogs are very inconvenient to us. The attitudes to bogs, the demonization of bogs, goes back a very, very long time. And it's not even a plantation thing from the 1600s. It goes back to the 12th century. Uh, we had a, a guy called Geraldus Cambrensis, the famous Gerald of Wales said, the inhabitants of Ireland do not have affinity with castles as a means of defense. Their strongholds are the woods and they live in their stinking bogs and trenches. The boglands have been demonized because that's where the outlaws live, that's where the shocks and the drains are. You know, it's not agricultural land, it's not good land, in inverted commas, it's not productive. For the colonists, they need that cleared. There was a word that they had called wood cairn, and wood cairn is basically like the outlaws. It's a Robin Hood syndrome. There was an act of parliament signed by Victoria for the reclamation of the bogs and wastelands and slab lands. Slab, slab is a, is, is a real good Ulster Scots word. 1848, massive reclamation. And they used all those words, improvement, gaining land, reclamation. And on the other hand, they had the words wilderness and slab lands or slob lands. you get from the 1840s onwards these schemes for the lowering of the loch, uh, 
for two reasons. One, to be fair, was to alleviate flooding, but that was flooding on land or flooding on bogs. And the other was just simply to, to, to get more land to, rec to reclaim it. So you've got this massive, right up until the 1950s, uh, reclamation of the wastelands, the slublands around Loch Ney, uh, to gain good land, to improve it. In many ways, it's taken us a long time uh, to, to, to get rid of that attitude. I mean, up to the present day, my own family, you know, you cut turf to burn it. And now we realise that the bogs are probably the best carbon sink in, and indeed these wetlands uh, in, in, in the world. I mean, they absorb much more carbon than trees do. And of course, destroying them and cutting them is, is releasing the carbon as well. So, I mean, they are our Amazon forest. The way we approach looking at an area of ground for restoration is we'll look at maps and aerial photographs. And over the years I, I've realised there's actually a really rich language around peat bogs um, that's all really amazingly recorded in our OS maps. So there'll be loads of peaty names um, that we know are likely to be bog and that will hone us in and we'll, we'll kind of go out and target our surveys around these names. So things like you know, the usual ones, moss, Anything black is usually a signal there's peat around. Uh, so even watercourses, the black water of Dee, uh, would show me actually that's probably quite a peaty catchment. Uh, there's a great example, just uh, last week we were out in a huge range of hills um, and we were serving one hill looking across to a hill ground, upland ground about 600 metres up, and we were looking across to another hill and we could see all these peat hags on this hill. We thought, my goodness, me, where, where is that? So we get the big OS map out, you know, set it down with stones so we can actually see it, stop the wind blowing it away, look at it, and lo and behold, it's called Haggy Hill. So we assume those peat hags are quite historic, but immediately we, we pick out all the Haggy Hills from that map and we look across the landscape and sure enough, that's where there's peat. Um, so things like that, using language, using the way that we recorded language around peat bogs is actually really helpful now. I think what it shows is people lived in that landscape, they used that landscape, the landscape was important to them. Um, nowadays, you know, we look at areas of bog like this and they're pretty, well, wet and windy today, uh, pretty brown and foreboding, and we, we kind of disconnect from them. But if you look at the language used, people were using these hills, they were using these peat bogs, they were cultivating them. So I think the language shows that we used to really value these areas and how, how we lived. Although it might look quite brown and barren and all the same, actually look into a peat bog, look at what's growing here, really fascinating plants that have really adapted to these very strange conditions. They need to be acid loving, they need to like have their roots wet, um, be able to cope in quite wet acidic conditions. So you get things like sphagnum mosses, which actually help maintain the wetness and the acidity of a peat bog. Um, so if you've got lots of sphagnum across your site, as we do in places here, it's a really, really good sign that your, your site is functioning well. But you also get um, things that have adapted to very nutrient poor conditions as well. So we have a plant called the sundew, which is a, almost like a little tiny Venus flytrap and it actually feeds on insects because it has to get its nutrients from somewhere. You get bog cotton, uh, which just looks like little fluff balls of cotton wool on the end of a stalk that blow in the wind. Very characteristic of an acidic bog. So if you see lots of cotton grass, you know that's a boggy place. Um, we get amazing flowers with bog asphodel as well. Very vividly yellow um, flowers that grow in, in our wetter areas of bogs. We get plants like bog myrtle. And bog myrtle is an incredibly pungent smelling, really nice smelling plant. If you rub the leaves, you get a wonderful smell. Apparently it's a midi repellent. Uh, I don't think it's never really worked for me. Um, but in the olden days, it was really important for beer making. It was used to replace hops, actually, bog myrtle. So again, there's plants here that, that we've used over the years. 
um, but we're kind of forgetting about. But yeah, lots of interesting plants. In the UK, it, it's more carbon in our peat than there is in all the above ground biomass. Forestry, grassland, everything combined. It's, it's by far and away the most significant carbon store. So here's a, a peat probe, and this is for measuring uh, the depth of, of the peat in a peat bog. And you can feel how deep it is. So eventually it'll stop when it hits the bottom, you hit the substrate. Here, if you push it in, you can see how easily it goes in. Nice wet bog. It's still going there, actually. Um, and the idea is you can just kind of add lens to this probe, but I've got two made up here. So I push these two in. And your probe will stop. Oh, and that's it stopping just about there. So we're, we're almost, almost two metres of peat here we're standing on. Very loosely speaking, it takes a, about a thousand years to lay down a metre of peat. We have peat bogs in Scotland that are like 11 metres deep. So we have huge reserves of this organic matter and peat, half of the organic matter, half of peat is carbon. So increasingly we understand that peatlands are really important carbon stores. They're our biggest terrestrial store of carbon in the UK. So we need to make sure they're in good condition, that they're functioning well and they're holding on to that carbon because obviously it's, it's more important now than ever. We don't have a peat map that's really, really locally accurate. So there's lots of kind of walking about hills with our peat probes, understanding where the peat is. And we'll be looking at condition as well. Is it drained? Um, are there bog pools, which is a sign that actually the site's in really good condition? Are there areas of bare peat that need to be looked at? What's the water doing? Is the water flowing anywhere, um, causing erosion? So we'll just get a basic understanding of condition. And then usually we'll, we'll sit down with the land manager and say, well, you know, how do you manage this ground? Are there any areas that are particularly useful for you in terms of restoration? So often when it comes to sheep farming, uh, some of these drains that we've dug over the years are really deep and very dangerous to stock. And you can lose a lot of sheep in these drains. So we'll go, well, we could actually restore those drains. So we could do a thing called reprofiling, which is tamping down the sides, blocking them up with really wide peat dams. And that means actually sheep are able to cross these areas much more safely. So a lot of what we do is trying to make peatland work for the landowner and the land manager. I think because they're not a highly productive system, so we're not talking really fertile grounds here, um, they've increasingly been seen over the decades, over the centuries, that there's not much you can do on a peat bog. They're not great for farming. They don't grow a really good, healthy grass sward. Um, so we've done lots of things to try and make them more productive. Um, the most simple being we've drained a lot of our peatlands. Most of our peatlands are drained in, to some degree, and that's about reducing the water table in the bog to try and change the kind of vegetation that's growing there. We're seeing a push for more tree cover, but that's largely driven by climate change and the need to kind of sequester more carbon. We now know that that is not the right thing to do. That if you plant and cultivate an area of deep peat for conifer growth, actually, the damage you're doing to the peat itself will be the long-term carbon source. So overall, you're not saving carbon, you could be losing carbon in the long term. So increasingly, that's playing into decision-making about how we go on to not only uh, not plant areas of deep peat, but actually should we be replanting areas that have been cultivated in the past for conifer crops. We're absolutely certain now that that's not what we should be doing um, for biodiversity, for our landscape and, and for carbon. I have a pond as well. The heron comes to it, the kingfishers come to it, the otters come to it. This is the pond here. Runs out to that point. Now, it's, it's quite deep. It's about three to four feet deep here. And then it tapers off, the idea being that the ducks to feed need a shallow, shallow, they don't feed, in, the mallard don't feed in deep water. So the, the shelves up and the mallard would feed, I used to feed it, and the mallard would have come in, but they still come in every, every night. It has overgrown with this mare's tail. 
At one stage it was uh, completely just water, no sign of any growth. And then it gradually grew over and it's difficult to clean it out now for the simple reason that there's so much life in it. You damage it, you need to clean it out a bit at a time and uh, so that you're not losing the wildlife that's in it. It would be full of frogs in the uh, frog spawning season and it would be, there are newts in it and uh, there are other small fish in it. When it was all water and you could see it was clear water, I used to see eels in it three feet long. I planted uh, various plants around it uh, at the first, but the whole thing has become overgrown. The stir was a word we used for dust. A dusty day, it was stir. And gutters were a wet, muddy place, and clabber was mixed water and dust mixed. And uh, the story goes about a local builder. He was showing the visitors round the building site. It was the boys' school in Balamina it was been built, and it was a very muddy site. And he said to the visitors, uh, don't be going in there and getting your feet all clabber. And the, boy, the visitor said, and, and what is clabber? He says, drukut stir, <laughs> which is wet dust. <laughs> drukut stir. Three hundred years ago, folk around here spoke Gaelic, uh, so that's been replaced by Scots, and uh, new Scots is um, gradually making way to standard Scottish English. Gaelic and Scots interacted for, you know, centuries, and they were borrowing one way and the other. The folk in New Galloway in the olden days, I mean, the shopkeepers spoke a totally different language for anybody that was going into the shop. Now, Mrs. K, she was quite a, an expert at the, being polite. If it was a, an English person or south of the border came into the shop, good afternoon, ma'am, how are you today? And then if I walked in, anyway, what do you want, boy? <laughs> I, read, I remember uh, going in there and once and she, she would say, like we were just talking about, the midges are lamentable. <laughs> <laughs> and would you like a brown bag or a paper poke? You know. <laughs> but every year, gear or due, but the folk that come into the area now, they're talking in a way that I'm having to change my idea or thought of dialect to be able to accept what I'm hearing coming from them. <laughs> and it's not fair in my ears. You know, it's, it sounds a bit cruel. But uh, New Galloway, for a while, you know, it was nicknamed Little Manchester. And they used to have gala days. And they used to bring up Manchester Pipe Band, Manchester Police Pipe Band, which were very good, don't get me wrong. You know, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but it just shows you how the introduction started to move in from Manchester. And now it's the anglers that are moving into the area because of Loch Ken and River Ken. They're coming in from Wigan. They're coming in new for, we, we doing Leeds, Bradford, are in the areas, and you can hear the, the dialect changing so much. We used to get down there, you could hear it quite often, was the heather bleat. That was the, common snipe, it would climb to a, a high altitude and it would plummet and the tw two tail feathers would vibrate. The farming, it's uh, mainly sheep around this area now, whereas before it used to be like uh, barley and the fields were ploughed, harrowed and rolled, which was perfect for our curlew, lapwing, you know, for nesting, just making a wee peeweep, you mean? Ah, the peeweep. 
and uh, you get the occasional meddled stanky coming up off the burns here. You'd see them as bairns when you were root girdling a trout. The meddled stanky being a, a moor hen or the, the dipper, or depending on what way you want to look at it, they were either meddled stanky with a white chest. They were either wee favourite bird. They could walk in water. We did a um, field name project down in Borg Parish where um, we uh, surveyed 51 ferns down in Borg and um, uh, scrave it down a hundred, uh, sorry, a thousand uh, individual uh, field names that otherwise would have been mostly forgotten about mm -hmm. in another generation. And most of the Scots uh, field names that were um, discovered during this uh, project. It was, uh, it was a biosphere project, a place project they call it, uh, Galloway and Ayrshire Biosphere. Uh, most of the Scots um, field names that we came across uh, for, the, for the Al Fermers down there were um, very workaday names, you know, like uh, a lot to do with animals, um, you know, field names like swine drum, um, uh, Coo Park, that kind of thing. They're all very, very, um, very basic workaday uh, names to do with the everyday existence of the Scots farmer doing in the Borg Parish. And it'd be the same, same about here, but we've no surveyed here yet. It's uh, a beautiful area down there. So is it famous for the horny Gaelic? <laughs> oh, okay, the Gaelic, oh, man, you get them in your lug, you're not here talking about it. They can, then they can't they turn round, they'll eat your brain out. <laughs> The Gaelic crikey, oh aye, I had a earwig. He's some boy that boy, because then Yen Logan comes out the other. The Patrick lose the fruitful fells, the plover lose the mountains, the woodcock haunts the lonely dells, the soaring hern the fountain. Through lofty groves the cushat roves, the path o' man to shun it, the hazel bush o'er hangs the thrush, the spreading thorn the linnet. Conservation is, um, we're getting a real fillet from it now coming out of the pandemic. We got the same coming out of the Second World War when it was self-evident that people wanted to uh, you know, commune with nature and get into wild places. So uh, conservation really took a, 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 a leap forward uh, back in those days and hopefully it will again now. There are records of, of golden eagles breeding in about a couple of dozen places across southern Scotland in the distant past. So, so in medieval times, there might have been as many as a, a couple of dozen. And that, uh, especially with the, 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 the breech loading shotgun in, in, uh, in uh, Victorian times, uh, when that took off, then eagles were persecuted um, in various different ways, but especially were shot and, and, and then poisoned as well um, by, um, by shepherds and by especially game keepers on grouse moors as, as, um, as shooting grouse became a, a big pastime because of course grouse are a, a favourite food of, um, of, um, of, of golden eagles. So the numbers of golden eagles declined through Victorian times and they became extinct in southern Scotland around 1876 or thereabouts uh, but not for that long, uh, for about 20 or 30 years and they returned to breed in Galloway um, sporadically uh, and in Ayr uh, uh, southern Ayrshire as well um, around 1905 and there are records of them attempting to breed in every decade of the early part of the, the 20th century but they, they came back in strength uh, just after the Second World War when all, all the gamekeepers of course had gone off to war and there was a relaxation of the persecution and their numbers grew uh, um, through the 1950s and 1960s and we had four pairs of golden eagles um, nesting in, in, the, in this part of the world back then. They were helped initially by the coming of the Forestry Commission and the, um, the planting of, of uh, much of southwest Scotland. Not because they like Sitka spruce trees, uh, far from it, but um, when the sheep were taken off the ground, the ground recovered and birds like grouse and, and hares and, and uh, deer and goats all multiplied and so there was an awful lot of food for the, for the eagles.
But the forests in Galloway, to my mind, sadly, are characterised by an awful lot of Sitka spruce, so, so, um, which is an alien conifer brought from, from the western seaboard of Canada. And it grows very well here, but it, it's not a native species, and um, they've been planted in pretty dense plantations over the last 50 or 60 years or so. So uh, they, have, they have been um, very bad news for a lot of native wildlife, including golden eagles. There's well over 500 pairs of golden eagles in, in the kind of whole of Scotland, but below the central belt in the south of Scotland here, we have just three pairs, so six birds, and their numbers haven't been increasing as they have been elsewhere in Scotland. So the thought was to do a translocation of young golden eagles, bring them down here into the south and help boost the limited and isolated population that we had to help boost the, the kind of genetics, to help boost the numbers and try and build the population into the south so that it can kind of merge and become part of the, the bigger Scottish population. We've just translocated eight golden eagles this summer. We can only take chicks from nests of twins. So golden eagles have twins, but not that often. Um, we have to you know, get a, a nest of twins and we take one chick somewhere between kind of five and seven weeks old so that they are brown and feathered so they can keep themselves warm and they can pick at food themselves so that we don't have to heat them or hand rear them in any way because they can they can imprint on human beings quite easily so we're very careful to handle them as little as possible and we take them from a nest under license with experienced climbers and raptor workers helping us we bring them down to aviaries here in the south of Scotland and we hold them in those aviaries for about six to eight weeks until they're ready to fly and we open the doors and we let them out and off they go and then we act as the parents essentially and provide them with supplementary food until they're ready to start hunting which they do they'll start to head off into areas like this They are, they're exploring lots of different areas and, and quite interestingly areas where golden eagles have bred historically so we don't quite know what it is that they see but there's something about the topography and the, the food availability maybe that, that attracts them and has attracted golden eagles in the past and they're going back to those places. We've got a, another couple of years to go, we've got a few more years of translocations and we'll, we'll see how we do with numbers but we're, we're really hoping to see the birds that we've released thrive and the first ones that we released in 2018 are now kind of three, four years old and are looking to breed so we've already seen them displaying, um, carrying nest material, that kind of thing which is fantastic because that's the next step is for them to find a mate, set up territory and to breed then they can start contributing to the pool of young birds in, in the south of Scotland. It's absolutely brilliant to see, really wonderful and fantastic to have that, you know, that volunteer effort, that volunteer input to restore part of the south of Scotland to, you know, the habitat that it could have been thousands of years ago. And the same that's happening down at Langham now, so the community buyout, um, you know, trying to return the land to a kind of nature reserve and, and almost kind of rewilding it to what it could have been. It's quite an exciting time. The Duke of Buccleuch has owned the land round about Langham and many other places in the borders for well over 400 years. Much of it was gifted by past king. The land actually stretched as far as Northamptonshire. A few years ago, the Duke of Buccleuch decided that they would start selling off ground but it wasn't something that they did in negotiation with people. They just didn't let farms again, and gradually they were sold off to f for uh, forestry interests. When it was announced that the moor was going to be sold, that just took everybody by surprise. We didn't anticipate that they were going to sell that huge Langham moor, which had been used for a century and a half or more uh, as a grouse uh, moor just took everybody aback, didn't it, Mary? Yeah, I was actually working at the paper at the time and the paper had gone to bed, as it were, so we had to print off, and I was there till 8 o'clock at night, print off this um, 
you know, hot news, as it were, off the press. So we distributed that uh, to people and we put it in shops because the, of this announcement, which, as Margaret said, took everybody by surprise. Nobody had anticipated that the, book, the Duke of Buccleu would, or the Buccleu family would put that land on the market. Although, you know, n not that long before it, about a year or maybe less than that, there had been the final report of the Langham Project published. The Langham Project was basically a project that was done by Buccleu, but also other stakeholders like the RSPB and Nature Scott, as it's called now, Scottish Natural Heritage, to look at how if a gr grouse moor could be restored by at the same time feeding raptors. And after many years of uh, a long piece of work, really long study, and they had stopped shooting grouse on the land probably 20 years before, the conclusions were that it couldn't be rehabilitated as a grouse moor. We decided that uh, we would never get another opportunity and it, it, there was a chance to do a community buyout. But community buyouts are not common. And in fact, they had not been done in the south of Scotland to any extent. They're quite common in the Highlands and Islands, have been for many, many years. Um, we approached um, the Scottish Land Fund and the first thing we were told was, well, you'll have to prove that the, the community is behind you and they set us a target of, I think it was 10% that we had to reach within a month. And we literally went out with petition sheets and knocked on people's doors, both in Langham and Cannonby, the small, the adjoining village. And we had nearly, I think it's 20%, Mary, mm -hmm. yeah. in less than, uh, uh, less than a fortnight. We also had to reach an agreement with the clue as to the value of the land. In May 2020, we came to this agreement about the valuation. In the middle, in middle of lockdown. lockdown, we managed to achieve the target with um, the final uh, organisation that came in with the last kind of £200,000 was the Woodland Trust. Wow. And Buclew gave us a, a, a little bit of a discount on the price. And so by the end of October, we could say to the Scottish Land Fund, we've done it, we've got the money and this is what we're buying. The actual handover took place on the 26th of March this year. The river running through the valley or the area is called the Taras, the River Taras. It was a well-known haunt of the border reavers. The border reavers were a menace, really, to both, you know, the Scottish king and the English king. It was, you couldn't get through the border at one time. In those days, it would have been a big bog. And in fact, we probably will turn it back into a big bog because we'll block up the drains because we know that carbon sequestration is, is big in peat bogs, you know, it, it, so we'll probably block it up again. So, so the Taras Valley um, is, is, you know, the, 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 where the land is. So we, we decided to call it the Taras Valley Nature Reserve with the ambition being to try and get it National Nature Reserve status. Restoring peatlands is a kind of easy one. It's a relatively straightforward thing to do. It has multiple benefits doing that. And, and so we, we're always there trying to drive the agenda forward. Uh, we now understand that, that peatland restoration is, is great, but it's now trying to integrate peatland restoration across everything that we do. Peatlands underpin a lot of our land use, a lot of our rural economy, be it forestry, farming, wind farms. We're trying to get peatland management, sustainable peatland management integrated into all of these different industries and land uses. I think it has to change if we ever want to uh, get back to what we were and that would nearly be impossible. It's difficult. Rewilding's the buzzword nowadays but it's very hard to rewild. The farmer wants to get the maximum from his land.
I think there is a place for rewilding, but not everywhere. If we want to have a, a, a diversity, a biodiversity that, that, that has the attractions that the United Kingdom uh, uh, you know, and, and Northern Ireland have enjoyed over um, previous decades, then we have to have a, a bit of a mix. But rewilding of some areas would be fantastic. But obviously managed areas are also important for, for other wildlife. We as human beings are taking a lot from our environment and we maybe need to find a better balance, uh, not just for wildlife and biodiversity, but also for you know, all the things that we need to, to keep us living and breathing. So I'm hoping it's moving in that direction. Um, it's difficult to see sometimes the areas that are being lost to biodiversity, but you know, I know there's a great team of folks doing a lot of work and it's trying to identify those things in the past and learning ways to, to do things differently going forward. Mm -hmm.